take the size of your attendance is inversely correlated on how things go, clearly. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. We will now report on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council, which was also attended by the Commission Vice President, Mr. Dombrovskis. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, and in line with our forward guidance, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. Regarding non-standard monetary policy measures, the asset purchase programs are proceeding well. As explained on previous occasions, our asset purchases of 60 billion euros per month are intended to run until the end of September 2016, and in any case, until we see a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation that is consistent with our aim of achieving inflation rates below but close to 2% over the medium term. When carrying out its assessment, the Governing Council will follow its monetary policy strategy and concentrate on trends in inflation, looking through fluctuations in measured inflation in either direction if judged to be transient and to have no implication for the medium-term outlook for price stability. Our monetary policy measures have contributed to a broad-based easing in financial conditions, uh, recovering inflation expectations, and more favorable borrowing conditions for firms and households. The effects of these measures are working their way through to the economy and are contributing to economic growth, a reduction in economic slack, and money and credit expansion. The full implementation of all our monetary policy measures will provide the necessary support to the euro area economy. Led, lead to a sustained return of inflation rates towards levels below but close to 2% in the medium term and underpin the firm anchoring of medium to long term inflation expectations. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with the economic analysis. In the first quarter of 2015, real GDP in the euro area rose by 0.4% quarter on quarter after 0.3% in the last quarter of 2014. In recent quarters, domestic demand, and in particular, private consumption, were the main drivers behind the ongoing recovery. The latest survey data to May remain consistent with a continuation of the modest growth trend in the second quarter. Looking ahead, we expect the economic recovery to broaden. Domestic demand should be further supported by our monetary policy measures and their favorable impact on financial conditions, as well as by the progress made with fiscal consolidation and structural reforms. Moreover, the low level of the price of oil should continue to support households' real disposable income and corporate profitability and therefore private consumption and investment. Furthermore, demand for euro area exports should benefit from improvements in price competitiveness. However, economic growth in the euro area is likely to continue to be dampened by the necessary balance sheet adjustments in a number of sectors and the sluggish pace of implementation of structural reforms. This assessment is also broadly reflected in the June 2015 Eurosystem staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area, which foresee annual real GDP increasing by 1.5% in 2015, 1.9% 1 in 2016, and 2% 2 in 2017. Compared with March 2015, ECB staff macroeconomic projections, the projections for real GDP growth over the projection horizon remain virtually unchanged. While remaining on the downside, the risks surrounding the economic outlook for the euro area have become more balanced 
on account of our, mon of our monetary policy decisions and oil price and exchange rate developments. Inflation bottomed out at the beginning of the year. According to Eurostat's flash estimate, Euro area annual HICP inflation was 0.3% in May 2015, up from 0% in April, and compared with minus 0.6% in January. On the basis of the information available and current oil futures prices, annual HICP inflation is expected to remain low in the months ahead and to rise towards the end of the year, also on account of base effects associated with the fall in oil prices in late 2014. Supported by the expected economic recovery, the impact of the lower euro exchange rate and the assumption embedded in oil futures markets of somewhat higher oil prices in the years ahead, inflation rates are expected to pick up further during 2016 and 2017. This assessment is also broadly reflected in the June 2015 Eurosystem staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area which foresee annual HICP inflation at 0.3% in 2015, 1.5% in 2016, and 1.8% 1 in 2017. In comparison with the March 2015 ECB staff macroeconomic projections, the inflation projections have been revised upwards for 2015 and remain unchanged for 2016 and 17. The Governing Council will continue to monitor closely the risks to the outlook for price developments over the medium term. In this context, we will focus in particular on the pass-through of our monetary policy measures, as well as on geopolitical exchange rate and energy price developments. We acknowledge that the staff projections are conditional on the full implementation of, our, of all our monetary policy measures in place. We also take into account that the degree of forecast uncertainty tends to increase with the length of the projection horizon. Turning to the monetary analysis, recent data confirm the increase in underlying growth in broad money, M3. The annual growth rate of M3 increased to 5.3% in April, up from 4.6% in March. Annual growth in M3 continues to be supported by its most liquid components, with the narrow monetary aggregate M1 growing at an annual rate of 10.5% in April. Loan dynamics gradually improved further. The annual rate of change of loans to non-financial corporations was minus 0.1% in April after minus 0.2% in March, continuing its gradual recovery from a trough of minus 3.2% in February 2014. Despite these improvements, the dynamics of loans to non-financial corporations remain subdued. They continued to reflect the lagged relationship with the business cycle, credit risk, credit supply factors, and the ongoing adjustment of financial and non-financial sector balance sheets. The annual growth rate of loans to households increased further to 1.3% in April 2015 after 1.1% in March. The monetary policy measures we have put in place will support further improvements both in borrowing costs for firms and households and in credit flows across the euro area. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirms the need to maintain a steady monetary policy course, firmly implementing the Governing Council monetary policy decisions. 
The full implementation of all our monetary policy measures will provide the necessary support to the economic recovery in the euro area and lead to a sustained return of inflation rates towards levels below but close to 2% in the medium term. Monetary policy is focused on maintaining price stability over the medium term, and its accommodative, monetary, its accommodative stance contributes to supporting economic activity. However, in order to reap the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute decisively. Given continued high structural unemployment and low potential output growth in the euro area, the ongoing cyclical recovery should be supported by effective structural policies. In particular, in order to increase investment, boost job creation, and raise productivity, both the implementation of product and labor market reforms and actions to improve the business environment for firms need to gain momentum in several countries. A swift and effective implementation of these reforms in an environment of accommodative monetary policy will not only lead to higher sustainable economic growth in the euro area, but will also raise expectations of permanently higher incomes. Therefore, it will encourage both households to expand consumption and firms to increase investment today, thus reinforcing the current cyclical economic recovery. As concerns fiscal developments, reflecting mainly the cyclical recovery and the low level of interest rates, the aggregate euro area general government deficit ratio is projected to decline gradually from 2.1% of GDP this year to 1.5% in 2017. The general government debt ratio is projected to decline gradually from 91.5% of GDP this year to 88.4% in 2017. Fiscal policies should support the economic recovery while remaining in compliance with the Stability and Growth Pact. Full and consistent implementation of the pact is key for confidence in our fiscal framework. We are now at your disposal for questions. Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, I was wondering if it would be possible for you to discuss the package agreed in Berlin on Monday night between yourself and the other Greek creditors, specifically how the ECB would react if Prime Minister Cyprus um, did not accept the package that's now in the process of being tabled. Um, for my second question, um, in light of the delay in the publication of the remarks by Benoit Curé um, last month, I mean, would it be possible for you to comment on the pros and cons of private meetings between senior ECB officials and market participants? Thanks. Thank you. Well, the first question, I mean, the answer is no, uh, because uh, basically uh, negotiations, and, and this, by the way, holds for also for, uh, for all the other possible questions on this issue, uh, negotiations are proceeding at this point in time, and uh, so there is no, no point in me commenting on different aspects of these negotiations and uh, different proposals. The, the, both, both the Greek government and uh, the institutions uh, have... Uh, now sets of proposals that they are confronting with, with each other. Uh, but let me say that the uh, one general statement, I mean, the governing council of the ECB wants Greece to stay in the euro, but there should be a strong agreement. And a strong agreement is one that produces growth, that has social fairness, but that is also fiscally sustainable and addresses the remaining sources or factors of financial instability in the financial sector. So this, this would be the component of a strong agreement. So that's what I want to say about that. Um, the other point, uh, two considerations. 
The first is that uh, we are certainly uh, aware of uh, the re prerequisite and the rules that are contained in the code of ethics, the ethical code that uh, governs the uh, executive board members' appearances in, in, different, in different sites and different, uh, on different occasions. Uh, they basically amount to saying that we should avoid any situation of conflict of interest and we should not divulge public information. Uh, what happened on that occasion was basically a mistake. The text of the speech was meant to go live immediately before the speech would take place, just before, and instead went live the morning after. So this uh, is leading us now to, uh, to uh, review our rules, to revisit our rules, making them more explicit. That is the, and we'll shortly come out with a new set of rules for as far as speaking engagements are concerned. John O'Donnell. You mentioned the issue of uh, Greek debt sustainability, uh, or alluded to it, and the importance of that. Is it perhaps appropriate that the ambition in relation to the primary surplus targets takes into, um, takes into account the recent downward developments in the Greek economy? And secondly, under what circumstances might the ECB be prepared to extend the limit on T-bills acceptance as collateral for emergency liquidity? Well, on, uh, on the second question, uh, you know what the condition should be. That there should be a credible perspective for a successful conclusion of the current review. And uh, that would uh, imply by the member countries a disbursement. That would be the condition for, uh, uh, for the governing council to consider, because in any event there is no automaticity for consider a lifting of the T-bill thresholds. And we are not there. Uh, on, uh, on the first question, the answer is uh, uh, yes. Yes, definitely. It would be the current, the current uh, um, downgraded perspectives growth perspectives of the Greek economy should be taken into account in uh, determine, determining what the appropriate budget surplus figures should be. Joanna Trick. Joanna Trick, uh, m and I. Mr. Draghi, there is a slight change in language in the introductory statement uh, this month compared to your previous meeting as regarding growth. Um, while this statement only says you expect the economic recovery to broaden, last time it said you expect it to broaden and strengthen. So um, does that mean that uh, we are running out of steam already? Um, so if you could clarify that, please. And then um, a second question. Again, on Greece, even if you can't give us details about the ongoing negotiations. Um, but should there no, be no deal um, uh, by next week? In light of the IMF's um, OK for Greece to repay, the bundling its July, June repayments to the end of the month, um, would a non-payment this Friday then uh, have any consequences? Um, to the Hackett schedule that you apply on ELA. On, Thank you uh, Yeah, there is a difference, yes. Uh, oh, now, on the first question, uh, you quite rightly pointed out there is a difference because there is a, um, let me say, recovery is on track exactly according to our projections. Um, and uh, however, we, had expected stronger figures, 
stronger than our projections originally. And at some point, uh, many, some indicators were showing this. There has been a loss of some loss of momentum, modest, I would say, loss of momentum, mostly due to weakening of the economies outside the euro area, emerging markets mostly. And um, on the other hand, uh, all survey indicators and uh, other data show that domestic demand in the euro area remains strong. So we just wanted to uh, point out this uh, slight loss of momentum coming from the trade sector. On the second point, I don't want to comment on that. We will have to examine exactly what the conditions are. The uh, option of bundling the payments uh, has been used by one country in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken. And we will see. Thank you. Alessandro Merli. Alessandro Merli, of Solid 24 Hours. There was a recent rise in yields uh, in a number of government bonds uh, sector in Europe, especially in Bunds. Uh, could you give us your assessment of that? Was this a positive development that follows the uh, recovery of the economy, or was it an unjustified tightening of uh, conditions? And uh, is there a fear or concern in the Governing Council that uh, QE may be adding to volatility in markets. Thank you. Um, well, the, um, yes, indeed, there was, there was uh, some reversal in uh, generally in financing conditions of recent. There have been many explanations that have been given, one of which is uh, what you hinted at, namely, uh, there are uh, said there is an improvement. One could be there are an improvement. There is an improvement in uh, the perspectives of uh, of growth. A second explanation is the uh, higher inflation expectations. A third explanation explanation is actually a bunch of technical conditions present in the markets, like uh, and here I'm going through quickly them. There have been one directional investments into long term maturities, and the turnaround has been quite abrupt. Second, there was a strong supply pressure in a sense that issuance had been quite significant by various governments in, in the meantime. Uh, there have been, uh, the third explanation is that um, when uh, shorter dated German boons became eligible, which they were not because of their negative yields, and they became more el uh, eligible later on, there was less need to buy longer dated bonds and that produces steepening of the curve. The fourth technical condition is simply that volatility by itself generated uh, further volatility and further selling. And the fifth is poor market liquidity because of the absence of certain significant investors in, uh, during this period of time. Now, uh, it's very difficult to distinguish between these three uh, three uh, sets of factors, sets of conditions. So we won't, uh, we won't speculate exactly on what explanation is the most likely. Uh, but certainly one lesson is that we should get used to periods of higher volatility. At very low levels of interest rates, asset prices tend to show higher volatility. And um, in terms of the impact that this might have on our monetary policy stance, let me tell you that the Governing Council was unanimous in its assessment that we should look through these developments and maintain a steady monetary policy stance. That's it. Annette Weisbach. Mr. President, um, <clears throat> one question on, on that, that we have to get used to greater volatility. What are you planning on doing uh, against that greater volatility? Are you planning on managing the yield curve going forward a bit more, or 
don't you care about greater volatility? And another question on greater volatility and the low rates is, the IMF is warning that asset managers and insurers in the Eurozone could get actually in trouble because of that policy. So are you preparing the next financial crisis? Or what would you do? <laughs> well, the, the answer to both questions is no, nothing. Uh, but um, let me also qualify this. Uh, we won't plan to, do, uh, to change our monetary policy stance. That will stay. As you know, as I've said many times, we have mandate which is maintaining price stability in the definition that we've, uh, uh, we've discussed uh, several times. And we plan to keep our steady course, our course steady and unchanged. And if anything, we will, uh, if necessary, we'll actually add to that. Um, the, on the, to the second point, uh, it's, it's quite right. A period, of, a, a long period, a protracted period of very low interest rates uh, causes a series of problems. Uh, first of all, it may increase the financial stability risk, but also it causes problems for insurance companies and for other uh, important financial market actors. Uh, is this a good reason to change our monetary policy? The answer is no. If we were to do the wrong monetary policy for addressing the problems of these specific sectors, we actually would do them a, 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 a disservice. We would undermine our price stability objective. We would create, uh, in the end, a more difficult situation for everybody. But what, so what's the answer? The answer is that when we see financial stability risks, they should be addressed by the proper instruments, which, which they are macro prudential instruments. And the second issue is but it's typical of insurance companies. Clearly, the insurance companies try to respond to this, to this situation in a variety of ways, which I don't want to discuss, because some of them have to do with their business models. And, um, but certainly, it's quite clear that certain regulatory provisions make their task of diversifying their investments into higher yield and uh, potentially more liquid investments, they make their task more difficult. Thank you. Mr. Draghi, um, can you tell us if you think that uh, the negotiations with Greek government are um, going in the right direction? And if you think that an agreement is close, and how close can it be? My second question would be uh, about uh, ECB's mandate. Uh, it's focused on the price stability, but some economists said uh, it should also include an objective of reducing uh, unemployment. Uh, can you tell us uh, if it's something you can uh, think of, and uh, if it's something who could be good uh, for the ECB? Thank you. Thank you. On, on the first issue, uh, it's, I, I responded before. I mean, I can't give you an update, uh, a real-time uh, report on how the negotiations are going, um, also because I'm here in Frankfurt and the negotiations are not taking place here, but also because they are in, actually in a, state, in a state of flux. There is, but as I said before, there is a general will and strong determination that uh, in the end an agreement will be found. But this agreement should be a strong agreement. And the components that I've listed before are the ones for which, towards which, certainly the uh, ECB is working. But I can say the same as far as the Economic Commission and the IMF are concerned, namely strong growth, social fairness, fiscal sustainability, and addressing the financial stability concerns. The, on the second point, Yes, we have a mandate. It's uh, one mandate that uh, is uh, formulated as uh, pursuing price stability, which the governing council, if I'm not mistaken, in 2003, you were there, no? Yes, yes. I was. you were there. In 2003, defined as uh, a rate of inflation which was, um, which was uh, close but below 2%. The monetary policy addresses the uh, say, the cyclical component of uh, the weakness in the economy. So for example, now, 
our monetary policy in pursuing price stability addresses also the cyclical component of the slack we have in the economy. So it does, it does good to both things, price stability and unemployment. Uh, but we should not forget that the structural component of our unemployment is high and was high even before the crisis. If I'm not mistaken, was in the border of 9%. So monetary policy cannot address the structural component of the weakness in economy, cannot address the reasons why, why, um, why potential growth is low. These issues should be addressed by structural policies. Thank you. Brian Blackstone. Brian Blackstone with the Wall Street Journal. Um, are you surprised at all at the, the pace with which inflation has climbed back into positive territory, given that it was minus 0 0.6 percent just, just four months ago? And in light of the fact that these inflation has come back, uh, can you say anything about the potential two-sided nature of this September 2016? Uh, end date for QE, that it could end sooner or it could end later, but that it could end sooner if we still get positive surprises on inflation. And my second question, going back to Greece, is uh, there's been five years of these crisis meetings, 11th hour negotiations. There's, there's obviously a lot at stake for the global economy, especially with the IMF and the international community involved. How come the Europeans haven't been able to get a better handle on how to handle this crisis? how to handle these negotiations, given that you've involved the international community in the, in the financing of Greece's rescue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the f answer to the first question is no, we have not been surprised. Inflation came out, turned out higher than what market expectations were, but not higher than our expectations. And, and this, in a sense, has a quite important consequence. It actually strengthened the governing council in, uh, in, uh, in its decisions, basically in its determination and its conviction that it has taken the right decision with the QE, with the size and the, desi and the design of the QE, but not only the QE, but also the monetary policy measures that have been taken previously in the previous months. Um, now, it, the, 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 second, the second part of your question is really, uh, what, how do we assess whether we have reached our objective of inflation or not? And, uh, and I've said several times that we, we, we're not, we're not going to be happy with a one-point inflation data, but we'll have to look through the medium term and uh, be convinced that uh, the objective has been reached in a sustained fashion through time. On the, on the other point, uh, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's a quite a complicated question to answer. Programs have been designed and they've been agreed. Some of these programs have been implemented. Some other parts have not been implemented. So that's the answer to your question. Why, why hasn't uh, the Eurozone, or more generally Europe, able to come up with, uh, a, with, a, with, a, with a situation which could be considered as, um, I would say, as normal in this situation, as ordinary situation. Well, it should be, I mean, as I said, programs have been designed, have been agreed, and have been implemented only partly. Thank you. Claudia Abasold. Uh, but looking at the staff estimates and with the inflation picking up, it seems that you're already there where you want to be in, on, on prices, on inflation. So does the governing council at least discuss an exit strategy of unconventional policy? Uh, no, the answer is no. I mean, exit strategies are really a high-class problem. And we are really far from that, so we, we are not discussing anything about that. 
But we are not there, by the way. I just wonder what makes you think and say that we are there in terms of inflation. We are still a long way to go. Alessandro Speciale. Alessandro Speciale, Bloomberg News. Um, another question on Greece. Um, the current haircuts on, uh, that are applied to Greek debt uh, relate to a period when it was foreseen that Greece would return to market. Uh, how long do you think they are sustainable and what would be the effect in this respect of a mispayment uh, to the IMF, for example? Thank you. You're perfectly right. Uh, we've been considering this now for a while. We'll have to see again at the next meeting how things are. What is the state uh, of, uh, of negotiations? What is the state of markets? What's the, in other words, how the evolution, the current evolution affects the quality of the Greek debt? And uh, that, that's the key, that's the key, the key decision we have to take. On the rest, I don't want to speculate, really. What happens if? Thank you. Jack Ewing. Um, Jack Ewing, uh, New York Times. I, I think you said a few minutes ago something about you're prepared to add to your monetary policy uh, measures, if I heard you correctly. Um, you're making faces, if maybe I heard you wrong, but uh, I just was gonna ask if you could uh, tell us uh, if does that mean that you would be willing to increase the size of the, your bond purchases? And if so, what would be uh, the trigger to do that? What would you be looking for? Second question, at the uh, G7 uh, finance minister and central bankers meeting uh, last uh, week, uh, you heard a presentation from Robert Schiller who warned of a, a bubble in the stock market. And I wonder if that's a concern that's shared by the uh, governing council or by you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, we, we have, uh, uh, we, we assess that our present monetary policy stance is adequate to reach our objectives. In fact, the reaching of the objectives in terms of inflation and growth is predicated, is conditional on the full implementation of the monetary policy stance has been, as it has been designed, as it has been announced, as it has been implemented. What I said before is that if need be, if there were other factors which would, for example, create an unwanted tightening of monetary policy or when we discussed growth, we said there are downside risks to growth and price stability, uh, then we would have to review and reconsider the size, the timing, the design of the program. So it's only to say that if needed, we will add to that. But so far, we frankly see no reason to do that. On the second point, uh, the, uh, the answer is we, at the present time, uh, we by the way, we are fully aware, as I said before, that low interest rates for a protracted period of time tend to generate financial stability risks. We monitor quite closely all these developments. And we don't see so far the emergence of these risks. Even, uh, even in, uh, in, the, in one of the sectors that is most often quoted, like the housing market, we see selected local situations where one could, uh, uh, could actually think that price movements are, are um, wide, um, but there, there isn't any real financial stability risk that we can see in that market or elsewhere. I should also add that the leverage, private sector leverage, because you, what, you, what you look at is lots of things. You don't look only about price increases, but you also want to see whether these increases in prices have been accompanied by increase in leverage. And uh, we don't see that, at least in bank leverage. But having said that, uh, I repeat what I said before, if there were to be financial stability risks in the stock market, for example, they would have to be addressed by the proper instruments, which is not a change in our monetary policy. Martin Wolczak. Uh, 
Uh, Dutch pension funds are hurt by low interest rate environment, just like the asset managers we talked about. Do you think their regulators should allow them to diversify more as well? Well, it's, uh, uh, it, it would be, I mean, it would be difficult for me to actually identify a set of pension funds in a specific country. Uh, what is quite clear, and I had that remark in mind, it was for insurance companies, that certain parts of the regulatory, uh, I would say, framework uh, make a diversification more difficult. In, for ex I'll make an example. It's not the only example, by the way. But the treatment that securitization receives in the present regulatory framework makes difficult to, to, for, for, for companies to invest in, uh, in, uh, in assets that are potentially Ill illiquid and make them liquid. That's one example. I mean, securitization is important to liquefy assets that are otherwise illiquid. Jean-Philippe Lacour. Yeah, am I on the edge of this room, <laughs> Mr. President? Maybe to sum up uh, the Greek issue on a broader perspective and a part of a strong, strong agreement uh, that could be reached in the next days. Um, do you honestly see Greece in a position to have a viable economy in the future? And second <laughs> question, um, again on this uh, mistake you acknowledged uh, regarding the disclosure of a speech uh, delivered uh, in, by ECB, ECB member. Um, the first reaction of ECB was to remove the rule of sending embargoed speeches. Do you find it fair or normal that the penalized people in this story are the journalists? Thank you. Uh, to uh, now the first question, yes, we see, we see uh, the Greek economy is a viable economy, provided, like any other economy, the right policies are being undertaken. The, uh, so uh, things that are unsustainable uh, in, a, in, a, in a certain situation because the policies that are being undertaken are wrong could become sustainable and uh, economies that are not viable under a certain set of policies could become viable under a different set. So uh, the, the judgment is certainly the economy is viable, but it has to have the right set of policies. In other words, policies that uh, favor, certainly favor equity, but also promote growth. Or if you want, the favor growth, but also promote equity. That, as I said before, growth with social fairness and fiscal sustainability. On, uh, on the second point, uh, let me only say that we are revisiting all our rules, including uh, including this uh, change that we have uh, announced last week. So we'll discuss when, when our rules are, outside, are out, are being published, then we'll discuss them again. Thank you. Mr. Kutamanos. Yes, uh, thank you. I've got two questions concerning Greece. Uh, the first one, um, with regard to the Greek payment uh, schedule, um, if Greece uh, defaults uh, technically uh, before an agreement can be reached, uh, what do the ECB rules uh, stipulate? Would you be able to just uh, raise the haircuts on Greek banks' uh, collateral, or would you have to stop ELA altogether immediately. I mean, you said there must be a credible prospect of agreement, but I can't imagine that this is the only ECB rule uh, uh, with regard to the ELA. And uh, the second question is, uh, do you think a Eurozone-wide guarantee on the Greek banking system would be a possible option if Greece uh, would default? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to speculate on the likelihood of these events. Uh, certainly, we, uh, but we do this regularly. We do assess the, how the uh, developments in the markets affect the quality of our collateral, namely the quality of the Greek bonds, Greek government bonds that have been posted as collateral. So where the conditions to, to change 
we would certainly go through a series of things. Yes, we would have to revisit our previous decisions. We are a rule-based institution, and uh, we follow this in this sense, the rules, exactly. We know that rules, for example, forbid monetary financing. And our ELA is devised and designed to supply credit to the private sector, not to finance the government. There is a collateral against these rules, which is, by the way, the rules for collateral for ELA are different from the rules of collateral for the monetary policy instruments. So these rules are being applied, and uh, they are being regularly reassessed uh, as developments in the financial markets unfold. The, um, what was the second question? A guarantee? Eurozone-wide guarantee for the Greek banking system. Yes, would a Eurozone-wide agreement on the Greek banking system would be a possible option if uh, Greece defaulted? No, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not privy I mean, uh, to these developments. We haven't discussed this that I, as far as I know. But the more general issue is really, I think we should focus now at this contingency in finding a strong agreement. Everything else would then follow, and, uh, and I'm pretty sure it would follow easily. But so all our energies should now be focused on, uh, on finding an agreement that is strong along the lines that I've illustrated before. Bondermann, NRC. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, uh, in September, the SMP bonds, uh, the Greek SMP bonds held by the ECB will reach uh, maturity. Um, does Greece have to fully pay them back itself, or can this be arranged via the ESM, like some Greek officials are suggesting? Thank you. Thank you. I don't, uh, again, I don't want to speculate on this, what uh, uh, the Greek leaders uh, have said, and I'm taking them at their word, is that it will be timely and fully, uh, they, the bonds, will be timely and fully paid. And we, stayed, we stay with that, uh, with that statement now. Thank you. Arantxa Inigues, please. Arantxa Spanish Press Agency, EFE. The president of the European uh, Commission, Mr. Juncker, and the Greece Prime Minister, Mr. Tsipras, are met in, uh, this evening in Brussels. Are you going to join them? Or is there another kind of uh, parallel meeting where the ECB is going to take part? Thank you. Now the answer is no. We are not joining that meeting. Thank you. Mr. Joost. Sebastian Joost, Die Welt, Mr. President, uh, to go to another issue, um, given the fact that the decision of the European Court of Justice is uh, coming closer regarding the OMT program, what are your expectations for that decision? And to put it more specific, do you expect any consequences for the design of your current QE program? Well, you generally, um, I mean, people in the world generally don't comment on uh, pronouncements by the judiciary or by courts. So if, you, if we don't comment on, on pronouncements, you can imagine how difficult it is to form an expectation on that. However, we do have the opinion of the, uh, of what's the general counsel. I think it's, uh, it has a specific term, which I can't rapporteur. remember now. The general rapporteur. The general rapporteur. And, and that is the only element upon which one can form an expectation. So, and that, that wouldn't suggest a redesign of the OMT program, although it has other interesting suggestions for other functions that the ECB is currently performing. Thank you. Mr. Zydra. Mr. President, maybe you could elaborate again on your decision not to tighten the collateral rules, haircut rules for, for collaterals used by Greek banks. I mean, the situation, the financial situation in Greece has deteriorated considerably since December when you took a lighter stance on this issue. So the whole thing looks like you're 
you said you're a rule-based institution and it looks like uh, you're taking political considerations, not willing to interfere in the ongoing political process. How would you comment that? I would comment that it's not true. Uh, simply, uh, simply said, we are not uh, either interfering or in any way taking a, st a st stance with respect to the current negotiations. We are a rules-based institution. But you have to understand that there are two different sets of rules. One is for mo collateral posted against monetary policy instruments, and the other one is collateral posted against the ELA. Uh, you should remember that the ELA is given by the National Central Bank. So from this viewpoint, the set of rules are different, is different. And um, so we will, uh, we will certainly continue discussing this. It's, uh, this difference is important, so much so that the majority required to change the Governing Council decisions about uh, ELA is two thirds. Because for when, 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 uh, when the ECB was, uh, was founded, was created, the idea was that national central banks ought to retain a certain margin of, uh, of discretionality, of discretion. So that is uh, that's the situation. But we, we currently discuss and reassess and see whether financial market developments within that specific and different set of rules warrant a change in the collateral haircut. Yes, please. Netherlands, Michel de Waard of the Netherlands Banking Review. I have a question. It's a couple of years ago now that we had the outburst of the European crisis. According to you, what is the main lesson? Well, <laughs> there are there are uh, there are several main lessons that one can take. Of course, the but the first that comes that comes to mind is that. Um, the, um, well, let me step back. The lessons that one draws from the, from the crisis depend on uh, what one views as the main factors, the main reasons for a crisis. One view is that uh, the crisis originated in jurisdictions other than the European one. And it was imported. And so the issue is, what was the main reason for the crisis in that jurisdiction? And here there is a variety of explanations, one of which is the two expansion of monetary policy. But another of which, which has, uh, in our view, in, I think in most members in the governing council's view, more weight, is the fact that financial regulation in that jurisdiction was basically, uh, was made much weaker in the early year 2000s basically um, lowering uh, levels on, uh, on, uh, on leverage, uh, lowering or canceling indebtedness levels, and a series of other, the subprime, uh, the subprime crisis is, uh, is mostly due to lack of supervision. So we can go through that. So one lesson we, we learned is that uh, we made stronger our financial system, we made stronger our banking system, and we uh, increased more generally the resilience of the financial services industry. So we don't know where the next crisis will come from, but at least uh, we ought to be reasonably confident that we've done everything we could to make our financial services industry more robust, stronger, more resilient. Don't you? Marijn Daantje Temmens, uh, News Hour, the Netherlands. Mr. President, you said earlier that uh, you were not surprised that inflation was already going up a little bit uh, because it was according to your models. Can you tell us uh, when your models are saying that it is below 2% or close to? Oh, we foresee 1.8% inflation in 2017. So the, the path is this. This year, uh, we foresee inflation staying low uh, for the remaining part of the year, and then picking up in 2016, reaching 1.5%, uh, mostly because of base effects. Namely, the oil prices should not continue to decline. And so if you compare the latest the data of the last part of last year, 
with the data that we, we would have at the end of this year under the assumption that we would have no further declines, you have a base effect. So that is the, but also there are other forces that, uh, that will close this, uh, will, will, will drive the inflation rate back to, to the objective, one of which is obviously the closing of the output gap. So the increase in domestic demand, the closing in the output gap, and some, uh, some sort of higher inflation rate domestically generated. Thank you. Yes, at the back. Uh, Jeroen de Boerzee, 24 in the Netherlands. Uh, you've emphasized the word uh, a strong deal is needed uh, for several times now. Um, what are the elements, in your opinion, of this strong deal? Does it mean Greece uh, applying all uh, reforms earlier agreed upon and no uh, debt relief, for example? Sorry, uh, what, what do you say? On Greece, yeah. if the elements of a strong deal, in your opinion, does it mean applying all reforms Greece uh, earlier uh, promised uh, uh, to do and, and no uh, form of debt, debt relief? No, strong means that uh, it should be strong both in design and implementation. It should have the reforms that promote growth and have uh, social fairness and are fiscally, and at the same time, produce a macroeconomic framework that is fiscally sustainable. Uh, some of the things that have been discussed uh, in, uh, in the course of the previous months are clearly fiscally unsustainable. So that is one, uh, one part of the strength. The other part of the strength, so the design, the second is implementation. Some of these reforms ought to be what is called in the, in the negotiating language, prior action. A strong program has prior action, meaning that certain things are, in, are, are done soon rather than late. And, um, and as I said before, the financing would come. Nobody, uh, nobody uh, neither the institutions nor the uh, Eurogroup members would conceive of a program, would define a strong program that it's not financed adequately. So financing would certainly be there. Thank you. So I think we have exhausted all the questions for today. And if I may, before I close the press conference today, I'd like to pay tribute to someone, to Marika De Feo, a colleague who many of you knew and who passed away recently. Um, she'd covered the ECB from the beginning. She was a very strong and fierce European supporter. And our thoughts are with her family. Thank you. Thank you.